While John was alive, I knew he would send a team to take me out. I waited for them to come. I would imagine that that's when you think, they know where I am, I'm in a small room. One of the reasons is I plan and plot. I always knew exactly what I was doing, where I was going to sit. I was armed every single day. One shotgun and three pistol, and a 357 Magnum by my side while I slept. I'll guarantee you Sammy's going to have a gun. I guarantee you he won't run. And I'll guarantee you he's going to try and kill us. And he was a thousand percent right. Yeah, I'm the old looking guy. Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? Good. Look at you. Is that now is this a custom uh, neon bull? Is this your neon bull? Or this is from like uh, uh, some product? Is this like from El Torito restaurant? Or like where'd you get this neon bull from? No, I had it made. You had it <laughs> I had it made. This is mine. You have your own. You have your own I personalized. Have, have, yes. You know, and I was just telling the story that uh, we're, not, we're not being taped right now, are we? Yeah, we're rolling. You're recording you, but you Oh, we're ro rolling? All yeah. right. Because it was a dirty joke. I don't want to say Tell, it. You know, we'll cut it out. Trust me, we're not going to screw him. So you were in with him. This is all oh, going yeah. to come But you were in with him, and you're in prison at the same time, and that's when you decided to testify, yeah. while you're in prison. Yeah. I was with him before I testified. I was with him 11 months before I cooperated. That's uh, the first 11 months I ever did in prison was with him. There's Why? Hundreds. Why? Well, he just didn't want to go to prison and he was just, you know, and he got caught on a whole bunch of lies. Now, this is a little bit of a complicated story. At the end, he was planning to take me out. Now, you can't take out the underboss of the family who's doing a lot of the work making money for the family. It backfires, you know, it scares the shit out of everybody. So he was planning this conversations he was having, he got caught on tape with, trying to tell Frankie LaCasso to spell, spend the uh, rumors around that I was killing uh, uh, my partners and taking over business, killing uh, union guys and taking over unions, so he thought that putting out these stories that, you know, I kind of lost my mind. And then at the end, he thought the coup de grace was a brilliant plan. He told me to kill Chin. Chin was involved in killing Frankie DeChico, who was very close to me. It was music to my ears. I started working on it. Um, so he thought the day I went down and killed Chin, I would come back, he would tell me how to go, it's done, and then he could take me out. Then he could grab the heads of the Genovese people, because Chin was the boss of the Genovese, and say, listen, I love Sammy, I had to take him out. He lost his mind. There's stories, he's been killing union guys and partners, and, and he came back and told me he killed Chin, he wants to take over. I love the guy, but I had to kill him. And he winds up taking over the, the Genovese family, you know, with good relationships, and he spreads that to all the captains, and everybody would be comfortable to say, this fucking Sammy actually lost his mind. John, poor John, he had to do it. So he got caught on tape with this whole plot. It, he didn't realize that. And uh, when we got arrested, we got arrested on those tapes. Now, after 11 months in prison, everybody, F. Lee Bailey, everybody told him we couldn't beat the case. He, he got another plot plan. And he grabbed me, he spoke to me, and he told me, he said, listen, Sammy, I he got saw you He saw you physically. Yes, we were together in MCC. And he says, I got a plan. I'm going to control the lawyers, and the lawyers are going to, the tapes are horrible. I know they're not true, but they're horrible makes you sound horrible. And I'm going to use that with the lawyers to say, it wasn't, you could hear John Gotti complaining about Sammy on tape. Um, it wasn't John Gotti. He lost control of this animal. So the jurors would say, okay, we hear John on the tape complaining about Sammy, killing people and doing all this stuff. 
And uh, so it's obviously not John, it's Sammy. I would get convicted and he would go free. That was his plan. When he told me that right to my face, and uh, I, I asked him, I said, John, are you sure that's what you want to do? And he says, I got to do that, Sammy. I'm the boss. The streets needs the boss. And you got to take the weight. When I he told you room, that in MCC? Yes, face to face. And uh, when I walked away, in my head, I said, fuck the mafia, fuck him. And I switched sides. I cooperated. And I was in already 11 months when that happened. The FBI confirmed all of this. Everybody confirmed it. There was guys who flipped after me who confirmed it. And that's exactly what happened. That's why I flipped. Now, that was when you were in for that stuff. Yes. And those tapes and you, you, you do that sentence. When you go back, when you go back for the ecstasy charges, that's, that's, you, you did like what, 12, 13 years? 15 18. years? 18. You so you do 18 years. And, and 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 you'd already testified. Yeah. You'd already left witness protection, correct? Yeah, I was only in the witness protection for 8 months. Right. So when you you're out of witness protection, you're viewed as somebody that turned on John. So when you go to prison for the ecstasy charges, was that probably one of the most nerve-wracking times of your life because I would imagine that that's when you think they know where I am. I'm in a small room. The guards aren't going to want to meddle. I mean, all the legend and lore of the mob, where were you afraid they were going to get you when you were in prison? I thought they would. I mean, I'm coming in with a lot of baggage. Yeah. I had a 20-year sentence. So I, that's where all these tattoos came from. What I did is I tattooed up, and I said, as soon as somebody fucks with me, I'm going to kill them in prison. I thought I'd never get out of prison and I would probably die in prison. So I said, I got nothing to lose. And that's what I'm going to do. I tattooed up, I put my prison hat on, and I said, the first person who fucks with me, I'm going to kill. And that's going to push people away thinking about coming over to me or fucking with me. So, but uh, it really never happened. People started hearing and understanding the story, even though I came back with baggage. I got along pretty good. I got along good with the ABs. I got along good with... Afro what's an Media. AB for people who don't know? What's that? The Aryan Brothers. Right, okay. I got along real good with them. Um, there was a lot of things that happened. And I got along with them. Um, and I got along with our familia. is a Mexican mafia gang uh, of a high level. Um, one of the bosses there there was a rumor in the ADX that they were going to hit him in the yard. They were going to take him out. And I had told this guy, Corn Fed, who was an AB, a friend of mine, he was a boss of the ABs. And I said, listen, they're going to take this guy out with the, a familiar. And he said, Sammy, I know the guy good. When you go in the yard, tell, let him know. And I did that. He already knew about the hit. He thanked me. Um, he thanked Corn Fed, and uh, after that, our familiar was very, very close to me. He must have talked to all his people, and uh, so I had two extremely powerful uh, prison gangs that uh, thought very highly of me. And didn't and, hold uh, it against you that you testified. They didn't look, say, you were a rat in any other ugly language like that. They didn't do that. No. 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 No, nobody does that in prison. Most people understood the story with John. Now, John got in trouble. He had a fight with a black guy. Black guy beat him up in prison pretty bad. It's, there's all facts and stories about it. Um, and he went to the ABs, and they shook him down. He went to the ABs to, for protection. Now, he paid protection money to the ABs to... Not only killed the black guy who beat him up, but for protection. Did they kill the black guy? No. The prison found out, and they moved him. Right. So he, he, got, he slid through. But they were shaking him down, and they had no respect for somebody who wants to be protected and is willing to pay for it. He's walking around with this tough guy persona, and he's paying for protection. 
I never did that in prison. Like I told you, if I had a problem with somebody, I was ready to take a shank and kill them. Now, I thought, I thought that would be my protection. Now, when you say that you tattooed up, what, what does that signify to you? You weren't a tattoo person before that time? Well, I had uh, two or three tattoos. And when I, the first time in prison I came out, I went in the program. They said, we'll remove them because people know you have those particular tattoos. So I took them off. When I went back in the second time, I tattooed, I got sleeves, my back, my chest, and the AB guys gave me Odin. They allowed me to put a tattoo of Odin on my arm. I still have it on my arm. Now, you can't do that. Odin is like their god. They, they look at Odin as their king. And uh, you, if you put that on your arm, they'll cut it off. But they gave me permission. They told me, Sammy, you're not one of us, but we love you and we're giving you permission to put it on your arm. And I did. So when I walked around prison yards with uh, them, they all saw that tattoo. They knew that I had permission. And uh, they all respect, they, they treated me like I was one of theirs. And they used to ask me questions. They wanted to know the structure of the mafia. I had asked them why. And they said, well, your organization has lasted a thousand years. So we want to understand it and use it in our own organization. And there's a few organizations that did that. The Familia spoke to me about it, the ABs, and I had told them about the f structure of the mafia, our rules, our regulations, and um, they were loving on that stuff. And uh, they all knew exactly what John did. They, they didn't, obviously, when he went in, he wasn't liked in prison at all. I love, so, I love how you're there and you're with the, uh, the Aryan Brotherhood and the, the mafia that we know, they've got nicknames, the Italians have nicknames like Bobby Bacala and you'd be like with Tommy Scongeals and this and that, but their nicknames are Corn Fed. <laughs> Yeah. You know why is, you know, the Corn Fed label came, he was 6'2 or 6'3 and didn't work out with weights. You never see a body like this in your life. And it's, Corn Fed was like, he's like a farmer. Yeah. He's born with that, you know. Bulk. Milk, that bulk. Yeah, he didn't have to work out for it. And uh, so they named him Corn Fed. His name was Paul Snyder, his real name. And he has... Uh, I believe three life sentences. He, he came in with uh, a case. It wasn't a life sentence. He got two or three more cases, every one of them for murders in prison. He was a boss in the ABs. And uh, that's what he, he's currently alive. And uh, he has uh, three life sentences plus 100 years. They'll never let him out. God, that's funny. Um now, let me ask, start by asking you, because we, we detoured up front, which is fine, but, you know, you're doing this work, and the whole time you're doing this work, there's a whole layer of society that's out to get you, that's out to catch you. Not your own people, not other organized crime people, but law enforcement. There's yeah. cops and detectives and state police and feds and everything, and, and, and the DEA and everything. And they're all coming after you. And did you, was there a part of you that you understood that? You didn't begrudge them that they had a job to do? Did you kind of recognize that and say, hey, these guys, you know, we're breaking the law and they got to do what they got to do? Or did you think all of them were the enemy? Was it always bitter between them? No, no. Them? Yeah, listen, I, I dealt with a lot of agents on a constant basis. I got to know their names and who they were. I saw them every day watching. And uh, they were legit. In other words, they had a job. And I didn't, re you know, to catch us, we had a job is to get away. And uh, as long as they told the truth, I don't begrudge them. It's people who lied about people, made up lies and did all kinds of bullshit that I hated them. But after I cooperated, I got to know them. I actually lived with them for years. I was in Quantico, a, a military base, for months and months and months. I lived with them every day of the week. Um, and I got to know a lot of them. Like Frankie Pantangeli. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, and I got to friendly with some of them. Yeah. You know, some of them I, I got rid of right away. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was first there and, you know, I'm going to cooperate, they're going to hear stories and stuff. And uh, one guy came to me before we went to bed at night. He came to me and said, Sammy, um, me and you are going to be super close. We're going to have secrets. He's playing good guy, bad guy with me. Good cop, bad cop. I, I'm not stupid. So I said, well, what kind of secrets are we going to have? I'm cooperating. I, I guess there is no secrets. He said, no, no, we'll have secrets. And I told him, are you gay? What kind of secrets are we gonna, we're going to have? So he said, no, no, I'm not gay. But the bosses got rid of him one, two, three. To try and, they said he's too sharp to play games with. And they had guys around me who literally were open and honest and sincere. And uh, I used to fuck with them all the time. I, you know, I played chess with them. Uh, I actually beat one of the guys who was a good chess player. I, I knew I was going to lose. I took his piece and put it next to his piece and checkmated him, which is cheating. And he, he looked at me and he said, uh, oh, my God, how did you do that? I said, I, I, listen, son, I played this game for quite a while. <laughs> he never realized I was cheating. Now, beyond the ones that were handling you, if you will, during uh, uh, when you testified and so forth, during your career, when you're out and you're younger, not the rampers, but when you're a made guy and there's a lot of money on the line, I would assume you wanted the cops to cooperate with you or there were times when it would be helpful if the cops co cooperated with you. And you didn't want to get that wrong, meaning you didn't want to go after a guy and make a play on a cop or somebody and you didn't know if he was going to cooperate with you. Meaning, was there a tell? Was there a tell you would see that would tell you that a cop was ready to come over and he was dirty and he would, he would cooperate with you? I, yeah. I mean, it, it, it became obvious. I mean... But uh, you, you kind of distinguished uh, the difference. You know, I wasn't really looking for that. Right. But occasionally it came by. You know, when I was a kid, when I was the Rampers, we had an after-hour club. They were on the payroll. Right. Every week we would give them money. But that was kid shit, really. Right. When I got older, I really wanted to pull away. Some guys had connections, and that was good enough for me. I wasn't looking for... A connection. Right. I didn't want to get close to them, but I, you know, like this guy Frank and Maddie, they used to call them the twins. You saw one, you saw the other. They were actually put on my detail. I saw them all the time. One time, Christmas time, I came to my office and my secretary was there. It was snowing. It was cold, and she said that Frank and Maddie are out there watching. She even knew their name. We knew their names and everything. So. Uh, I said, how long were they out there? She said, quite a while. So I got a box, cardboard box. I got some coffee. I got, we, I had cookies, all kinds of cannolis, everything. And I put a box full of stuff. I went out, I walked to the car in the snow, knocked on the window and said, bro, you guys don't ever go home? And said, this is our job. I said, here's a box of uh, cookies and coffee and stuff like that. So they said, no, we can't take that. I said, listen, it's not a bribe. It's cookies, bro. It's, I know you're not going to do nothing for So take the fucking cookies. They took the cookies, and, uh, and uh, I became, when I flipped, those are the guys I actually flipped with. Um, on a tougher subject, because I think about this, I think about, you know, the the psychological difficulties of doing some of the things you did. The first time you killed somebody, and every time thereafter, um, was it always the same feeling, or was there a time when, you know, because a lot of it was at someone's direction. You were, you were being told to do this. You were being ordered to do this. You were given a hit. You were given a job. Did you have to, did you have to medicate yourself to get yourself in that state to do that job, to either get jacked up and high and really, really kind of like a blind kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, energy and power or get numb? 
were you always in a natural state or did you have to take a pill and take a couple of shots before you could do that? What was the state yeah, of well, mind? F- first of all, I was always, a, a hit to me was always in order. I never did a hit right. with, really without an order. So you improvised, yeah. So it, it always came from the top. You're not allowed to do it without you know, permission anyway. Right. So, uh, but um, after the first hit, and uh, and I was into it. I became a very good hit guy. One of the reasons is is that I I was able to think. I was a thinker. I plan and plot a hit. I I focus in. I'm going to use the word you. I'm not talking about you, but mm. I focus in on you, on everything you did, every place you went. And I would disregard my family, my friends, my business, money. Nothing meant nothing to me other than you and where I was going to kill you. I became very, very efficient at it. I became, and that's how I was used by bosses so many different times because they knew that if I got your contract, you were finished. I never took drugs. The only thing I did as a kid when I, I smoked pot, but I never really took drugs. I never really drank. I didn't need any of that. And I thought that would be the worst thing you could do because that will fuck up how you think. And that's when you're going to make a mistake. Did most, of the so other guys, just, did most of the other guys take drugs and drink? Uh, not, some did. N- not a lot. N- uh, not, as, you know, not as many as but, you think. Uh, no, not as many as you think. Right. Some of them became hit guys, and some of them became better at it. You know, I'll give you an example. Me and my Gumbada Ali boy, um, we would go on stick-ups when we were younger, before we got made, and uh, and I was always the first guy in with a gun, stick him up, and he would take my back. And my my mentor Tato said, Sammy, why are you the the guy in first all the time? So I said, because I'm comfortable. He's got my back. I feel really comfortable. He said, listen, Ali Boy's a good guy to have your back. He said, but he's reactionary. If there's a problem, he's going to start shooting right away. You're a thinker. Let him go in first. If there's a problem, I'm sure you'll probably try to think your way out. I know you'll shoot, but you'll think your way out. You're a thinker. And uh, I thought of that, and he was right. My Gumbada was a tough guy. I loved him, not putting him down. But uh, if there was a cop walk in by accident, he would have probably shot him. Instead of understanding, this guy just walked into something. He, he doesn't realize it. He doesn't have to be shot. You can try and f- move around it and deal with it. Um, that's what I would do. So my Gumbada would shoot you in a minute. So I started to learn that's the way it goes. I was in three mafia wars, and I planned and plotted in two of them. The whole thing went Which three? Just, Which three? The Philadelphia. Well, I started off in the Colombo family. Joey the second, Gallo? Yes. The, for, the second part of the mafia. Uh, there was two parts to it. The Profaci and uh, the Gallos. Everybody went to prison. It stopped. When Crazy Joe Gallo came out, the second part started. I was already with the Colombo people, um, and I was told to hit the mattresses with them. I wasn't doing any planning, but anyway, I was brand new. I did already work, uh, meaning a murder. So they took me in that mur- uh, case. I was eventually transferred over to the Gambino family, and in the Gambino family, when uh, Angelo Bruno was killed in Philadelphia, um, there was a war broke out. It ended up, it's a long story, but it ended I up. I listened to the story was, on the podcast. Yeah. The guy well, you took out to the golf that. club. Yes, Johnny Keys. Right. So they couldn't, five families and the Philadelphia family couldn't kill him. And I wound up getting the hit. And I wound up killing them. It was a commission hit. It's, it's at the highest level, and you watched the, the, and heard the video. Uh, matter of fact, I'm working on a movie about that now with people, and uh, 
Everybody seems to be fascinated with that. And then I, I controlled the whole Castellano hit. I did the planning and the plotting, and I was on the hit. John Gotti was in the car next to me. He was my driver. I had the walkie-talkie, and I controlled 11 people who were on the hit. Now, two things. One is Johnny Keys in the podcast, which I listened to, nearly all of the podcast. I mean, I listened to a lot of it. And you tell that story. It's a very powerful and very, uh, you know, romantic even story that you said, this guy's more Cosa Nostra than, 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 than any of us, you know. He yes. was old school and he was, he was like teaching you in the car or the van or whatever the fuck you were in to, uh, uh, to, to, to do the hit, not get caught. I think you said something, but he said, get down in the windows because you're going through the toll or something. And, um, but my point is, is that you, you felt this admiration for him and you thought he was this great old school guy. But at the same right. time, he did the hit without the approval of the commission, correct? That's why you were, you know, that's why you were killing him because you, you were ordered to kill him because he broke the rules, correct? Well, he didn't actually do the hit. I mean, on right. Angelo Bruno. Oh, got it. That, that was all bullshit. He was actually Angelo Bruno's cousin. He was fighting the other side. I mean, we really, it was their problem, their thing. And you know what, like you said, uh, he was, you know, telling me how to do the hit on himself. What? And I, I came to learn now that I'm writing is that uh, we were like two samurais. We were both hit guys. He was a lot better, older, smarter, wiser than me. Um, and we met on the battlefield. And what, I, what happened is when he was in that van, he knew he lost. He knew I did something that the whole six families couldn't do. And he had a respect for me. And uh, he actually was educating me and, un and teaching me Goza Nostra, knowing he was going to die. But if you know about samurais, when they lose, they want to die, but they want to die in an honorable way. With my Whether shoes off. Put, yes, well, with him, it was his shoes off. He was sending a message to his wife. Who would do that at 70 years old? I mean, he blew me away with things he wanted. But I understood it later on when it was explained. And, uh, you know, people say, well, when did you change? In The Godfather, there was a scene where Michael is in a room. His wife is outside. And after this is all done, people are in the room with him. Guys are coming over, grabbing his hand, kissing his hand. And the door closes on his wife. The door closed for Michael on everything. God, country, his wife, everything. He was 1,000% goes in Austria. The door closed to the outside world. To me, the Johnny Keys story was that same thing. The door closed on everything. I became goes in Austria mostly because of him. Hmm in a way that I wasn't before. So um, the door to my life closed on that hit. Why, uh, why did you want to get out of witness protection? Well, I wanted no part of it. I had money when I got out of prison. I wanted no part of the witness protection program. You had to change your name um, and do things and live by certain rules. I did my time. I didn't want to have nothing to do with uh, witness protection. I didn't need their help. I didn't need their money. So, but they wanted me bad. They called me in a meeting and they said, Sammy, you got 19 murders. You got sentenced to five years. The government did the right thing with you. You're going to make them look like horseshit if you don't come in. Give them some more time. Volunteer for this program. And make, they could pound their chest a little bit. I felt they, they did treat me right, and I did a five-year sentence. I should have did a hell of a lot more than that. So I agreed to do one year and one year only. 
And uh, that's what I did. And I stayed in the program. Uh, some woman recognized me. They wanted me to start over. I wouldn't do it. So in eight months, I said, I promise you one year, I'm not starting over. And they said, you have to. And I said, well, I'm not going to. And they said, well, then you'd have to sign out. And I said, then I'm going to sign out. I promise you, I'm in eight months. I promise you a year. Four more months, I'll give you. And if you don't accept that, then I quit. I'm out. They can't force you to stay. And I quit. I was out. And I went to Arizona where my family was. And you weren't afraid? No. Did you, get, did you ever get the impression that John's son, that John Jr., was going to try to do something to you? That he had some obligation? Not, not that he would succeed, but did you, did you ever get a sense that he was out there trying to find you? While John was alive, I knew he would send a team down. Again, I'm a professional hit guy of mega proportions. And I waited for that team. I was armed every single day. I lived in an area in a spot that I always had the advantage. I always knew exactly what I was doing, where I was going to sit, and I was always armed. When I got pinched for the ecstasy in my house, I had four guns hidden, all of them loaded, one shotgun and three pistols, and a 357 Magnum by my side while I slept. I waited for them to come. Right. I knew John would send them. They did. They found me. They sat on me for months and months and months. And they always felt like they would never be in the proper position. And one guy, Huck, who was in my crew, made guy, said, I'll guarantee you Sammy's going to have a gun. I guarantee you he won't run. And I guarantee you he's going to try and kill us. And he was a thousand percent right. But before they had a chance to make the move, they sat on me for months and were afraid to make the move. Um, I got pinched for ecstasy and I went to prison and that was over. So I didn't underestimate that John would send somebody. He talked to his brother Pete, um, who became the boss, a complete fucking moron. And he gave Huck and a few guys the hit. And, uh, and he botched the whole thing. He didn't send the right guys. Now, a, a hit for you in your career, was it left to you to decide how? In Again, I can only quote this kind of silly <coughs> language of like mafia lore and legend that somebody goes out and starts the car and the car blows up. Was that in your, uh, was that in your uh, uh, toolkit there? Was it always a gun and shooting somebody in the head? Or were there other methods? Was there poisoning, blowing up a car? Was there only one option for you or there were multiple options? For me, there was only one. First of all, our rule when you get made, we're not supposed to use bombs. They use that in Italy. We don't use that in the United States. It could hurt too many people and destroy our complete reputation. It happened once or twice, a couple of times, but it's against our rules. So to me, using a bomb was out of the question. I don't shoot from a car. I wait until I got you right. I, you, you, we're face to face when I shoot you. You ain't getting away. Hmm. So a gun to me is, or a knife, is very, very right there in your face. I don't take chances. When I come after you, you're going to die. So, and, and, and you could use poison. I never used poison, never considered it. It was used once or twice that I know of. But um, that wasn't my, my thing was a gun. Right. I thought maybe, and, you know, they'd overdose people or things like that, you know. Well, they do that in certain cases, but uh, not me. Right. You had that your wasn't method. My thing. Yeah. Now, uh, the ecstasy case. You spent years in New York, and is it safe to say you weren't involved in drugs very much? You tended to be, if I read the paperwork correctly, you tended to be, be heavily invested in uh, uh, construction corruption and the construction yeah. business in New York. Yeah, and that was your the... forte for years, correct? 
Yes, I did construction, loan sharking, different businesses. I didn't do drugs, not that I knock anybody who did it. Um, I just didn't like the people that you had to deal with. So I never did drugs for that reason. There was a lot of money in it, um, but I didn't like the people that you had to deal with. So I did construction and stuff like that, just as much money without that. And now when you start dealing drugs and get that reputation, you not only got the FBI, you got the, the drug and for DEA, everybody and his mother's on your back. So I didn't want anything to do with that. And all the years of investigations showed that. Now, so, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. So what? No, so I, that's why I didn't deal drugs. It's not that they, I look down on people who did it. Some people uh, didn't have any talents, and it's a, an easy way to make money. I, di I didn't need that. I didn't want it. And like I said, I didn't want to deal with the elements that were involved with it. So describe for people who don't know, how does organized crime, Cosa Nostra, whatever you want to call it, how do they make money in the construction business? What do they do? Where's the, what, what, what's the mechanism where the corruption comes in, typically? Well, we control, I controlled a whole bunch of unions. I, the Teamsters, not the Teamsters, the truckers, but the Teamsters in construction that have the gate around buildings that are going to go up. And the Teamster foreman that opens the gate and all the trucks go through the gate while they do these 50, 60, 70 million dollar projects, 100 million dollar projects. So uh, anytime I wanted that gate closed and delayed, I could do it. So if I wanted, let's say I had a plumbing company, a drywall company, if I wanted a job um, and you didn't want to give it to me, now I would, could give you a hard time with the unions, I could give you, there was coalitions I could give you, associations. So, you know, I, I, first of all, I made sure that my companies were qualified for the work. I mean, you're an actor, you know what it is. Unions could be a pain in the ass. We can exert a lot of pressure on projects, even in Hollywood. So after a while, I mean, if you, my nephew needs a job and wants to work in a movie, some of the producers may turn around and say, give this kid a job and, and make peace. And so it's the same thing with construction. With unions, it's, it's every business you could possibly think of. It's every trade, like I said, Hollywood, all the way down to everything. So we were very powerful. I was with the unions. Paul was extremely powerful. I became his guy who... He was able to use me in different deals to make deals with other families, to negotiate things. All the families had different unions. So a lot of times, if like uh, I didn't have any control over the electricians, but I would go to people who did have connections with the electricians and couldn't back them off of things or do certain things that we wanted them to do. So uh, that was the real power the power of being able to shut down huge projects. And, uh, and the money that came to you came from the developers. You'd say to them, the electricians are going to slow down a little bit here and fuck up your timetable unless you give me money. Where did the money come from? No, it came from doing the jobs. Right. In other words, I would do, I couldn't do a five, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve million dollar drywall job. Now, my number is not going to be cheap. It's not going to be super expensive, but it's not going to be cheap. So if you hire me, you know, you're going to know that if you do have legitimate problems, I could solve them for you. And, and I'm not going to give you any problems. So I can negotiate in that fact. It's not a shakedown. I can go in. I'm qualified. When I had uh, a drywall company, I had 200 carpenters working for me. So I didn't have a small company, and, but I was non-union. So they didn't have a problem. I could come in and do the job a little cheaper than a union company, and, uh, and I could get away with coming in with non-union people. They knew the union won't bother me. So I'm qualified to do the work. 
And I'll give you, Bobby Sasso was the head of the Teamsters Union, the Carpenters, uh, well, the Teamsters Union. He, held, he had a bunch of things. So let's say Trump, I'll use him as an example. He has, he has a project going up, and I'm bidding the job. And uh, he doesn't give me the job. So all of a sudden, the Teamster foreman has that gate shut. It doesn't open up at 7 or 8 in the morning. It opens up at 9 o'clock. The Teamster foreman is checking the, the trucks, their brakes, their lights, directional signals, everything. He's breaking balls. So I'm breaking balls. So he'll call up Bobby Sasson. You're going to kill me. I got concrete trucks. I got everything. I'm going to lose a fortune to keep this up. What are you doing? Bobby will tell them, listen, uh, the union guy is doing his job. Just in case there was bugs or whatever. He's doing his job. There's nothing I could do. Hey, by the way, they used to call me the little guy. Did that little guy get that drywall job? And he got the message loud and clear. There's no conversation. There's no nothing. Oh, oh, oh listen, I got another project coming out in a couple of weeks. Tell him to bid the job. He's, he's got it. And the and the and so the contract, the legitimate contract for the developer or, or the, the the GC on the job to do the drywall, there's a, there's a vig on top for you. That's that's where you make money. There's a piece no, of that I, contract I, for you. I just make money on the drywall. That, so you just it's, so it's legit dry. You, well, the money you're making is legit money. You just get the contract in a kind of a. A right, more, and uh, here's the here's the difference. A union contractor back then is paying a guy with benefits and everything thirty dollars an hour. Right. I don't have benefits. I'm not in the union, and I'm paying them fifteen, eighteen dollars an hour. Right. So there's look at the gap in there. Right. So I'm I'm bidding union price, but I'm paying eighteen dollars, not thirty dollars. So when I I don't I'm not looking for an envelope. I could walk away with a seven million dollar job, with a million dollar profit. Yeah. I don't need your envelope. Right, right. I um, just want the job. Uh, hold on one second. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back with it. I know where I want to go. Next question. Hold on. I got to take one quick break here. Hold on. I'm doing an interview over here with Alec Bowen. Who would have thunk that Sammy the Bowen would be sitting down with Alec Bowen? He's a good guy. This guy. It's like talking to a street guy. He's a tough guy. He's a good actor, too. He did a movie that a bear was hu hunting them. Him and another, I forgot the other actor's name. Great actor, too. I mean, I, I love that movie. I watched it, I'm going to tell him, I, I watched that movie fucking three times. <laughs> he, he, played, he played a hell of a part. He really did. I'll tell him when he comes out. Frank, you listening to this? Listen, I'm, I, I'm 77, pushing 78. I, I put the, uh, you know, too much for the old man to handle me like? <laughs> no, no, no. I, he just stepped out. I, I think he was clearing his throat or something. He will be right back. I, I just no, sent a message. No, I'm, I'm, te I'm only teasing. I'm only teasing. Uh, what was the name of that? What was that name of that movie he did with the bear? What, the, what is it? The Edge with um, Anthony Hopkins. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yes, 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 yes. That was a hell of a movie. I was just telling my girl over here. I watched that movie three times. <clears throat> now, um... Yeah. What percentage would you say back then, I'm assuming you were doing this construction stuff in the 80s, correct? Yes. And what percentage of the major jobs, you know, big jobs, what percentage of those do you think were uh, not on the up and up? Most of them? A lot of them? Well, when you, I mean, when you say... On the up and up. I mean, I did the work on the up and up, but I used the muscle of my name, my reputation. To get the, the job, union, to get a legit job. Get the legit job. Right. But when I went in, I did legit jobs. So, you know, I, we, I always felt, you know, you can shake down these contractors, uh, builders or developers once. They, they, you know, they all have connections with agents, politicians, I mean, you're not going to get away with it over and over again. If you can do the work just as good as anybody else, and you can help them that you're not a pain in the ass, and maybe even solve some of their problems, after a while, they'll have a problem with somebody else, a plumber's uh, union. And they may say, Sammy, 
we have a problem with this union, could you help us? And I helped them. I don't ask for nothing. So I become a plus to them. Right. I don't become a liability. You help I them become, out. I help them out. So I'm, not, I'm never, you know, you have to be able to f do the job successfully. I mean, that going in and, sh you know, bull bullying them and try to threaten them, that's going to last about nine minutes. You'll probably do time and it's over. Right. But if you go in the right way, I think you can, uh, you can make a good living. Now, obviously, John Gotti, I always tell this story, my friend Brian Hamill, whose brother Pete Hamill, the famous writer, Brian was one of the most famous still men in Hollywood. He was the number one still man who shot still photography on the sets of films. Woody Allen, Scorsese, right. Coppola. Brian was a great guy. He's, he is a great guy. And um, he's still alive. His brother Dennis wrote for the Daily News. And Dennis, I think he just died a little while ago. And Pete. But uh, Brian's still alive, and he's an old buddy of mine. I said, w where should I go uh, to dinner uh, uh, with my uh, girlfriend? I was dating this woman. This is a million years ago in New York. And he says, I want you to go to this place, Il Tre Merli, uh, for Italian food. He goes, then when you're done, he goes, what night are you going? He, this is how smart he was. He goes, what night are you going to go with her? I said, I'm going to go on a Monday. He goes, Monday, Monday, Monday. He goes, you take her to Il Tre Merli for dinner. And then I want you to walk a few blocks. I want you to go to Teormina in Little Italy. He goes, because Gotti goes there for dessert on Monday night. They have coffee and dessert on Monday nights. I go, you're kidding me. I thought he was completely bullshitting me. I mean, I'm a kid from Long Island. What the fuck do I know? We grew up with mafia legends in my town of Massapequa where Carlo Gambino lived. Right. Carlo right. Gambino lived in a cul-de-sac in a very nice section of town called Harbor Green. And the rumor was that when he would get his grass cut, he had his lawn guys cut everybody's grass in the cul-de-sac so it was the same height. He didn't want anybody's grass to be too high or too low. So he had the guy come and cut everybody's grass. Then the other story was that when the whole crazy Joe Gallo thing went down, Umberto's clam house, there's some big uh, mess coming down. He gives money to all of his neighbors to leave town. He buys them plane tickets and hotels. He says, I want you all to get out of here. For the next couple of weeks, I want you to leave because I don't know what's going to happen. You know, and, and he doesn't say that directly, but like in code. So who knows what this bullshit is? What's, what's for real? But I go right. to Tayormina, and I'm sitting there. It's me and this girl, and it's another couple. And this fucking guy who looks like a phone booth comes walking in. And he looks around and he snaps his fingers, and two more guys come in, and they go to every corner of the restaurant. They look around, and then they wave to the other guy, and the four guys come in with Gotti, and Gotti comes in. Yeah. And he sits down, and then a whole bunch of other guys, like 20 other guys in different cars right. out front. And um, they sit down, they have their coffee, blah, 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 blah. And then when they're done, you know, an hour goes by, 45 minutes, they get up, they, they, and they don't make a line, but it, it's, it's kind of like an unintentional line. They were all talking to each other, but they're moving, moving, moving toward him, and they kiss him on both cheeks, and then they all go home, and they all leave. And I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I thought I was going to swallow my tongue and choke to death. I'm in this room with this guy that's this legendary gangster, you know. And you can see, uh, like they teach you in acting class, you don't play the king. Don't play like you're the king. We know you're the king because of the way everybody around you treats you. That's right. how we know you're the right. king. And all these guys right. are lined up and they're all very, uh, uh, you know, um, approaching him very gingerly. Now, it's obvious that at some point you felt that he was um, a problem. You thought he was full of shit. Uh, but I guess what I want to say was prior to everything going down with the tapes and you deciding to testify, did you think he was a good boss ever? Or was he? Or did you always no. have your doubts about John as a boss? No, he wasn't a good boss. For, to, well, the thing you just explained is the worst possible thing you can do in goes in Austria. He's not an actor. We're not actors. We're gangsters. It's a secret society and a brotherhood. You mentioned Carlo Gambino. Let me give you a little Carlo Gambino. When he came in a room in a restaurant, all you did was look eye to eye and give a slight nod of the head, and that's your saying hello. You don't go give him a bottle of champagne. You don't wave, hey, Carlo. We don't do that. So what he did is he exposed all of Gozenostra. When I cooperated, I was living with the government. The government loved him. 
So I said, I don't just hate him. I mean, why do you love him? He gave us Kozanosha on a silver platter. He demanded what you just said, people to come down to the club. People we didn't never even knew were in the mafia. He demanded that they be there. We had them on film. We got their car, their plates. We followed them. Now we knew who was who, who got what, all that kissing on the cheek. When you got that kissing on the cheek, he said, Sammy, when you came, guys would jump up, grab you, give you a kiss. We, we knew your status just from that alone. So what he did was gave up the whole mafia on a silver platter, on his ego, and, and, and uh, he was a narcissist who put on this show. He bought into the whole Dapper Don thing. Without a doubt. If he knew what reporter was going to say, call him the Dapper Don, that, that, the, the, the reporter could have called him up and said, listen, I'm going to do an article, I'm going to call you the Dapper Don. He would have got 100000 <laughs> <laughs> You're my publicist. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. But but, no, no, but, but you, before this stuff, before he let it all become a little too melodramatic and he kind of broke some of the rules, you thought he was a good, you thought he was a good uh, Don? N no. I never thought he was you know, a you good never, You never thought he was good. Well, then, then, so, no. so, 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 so take that aside then. Who did you think was good? Who's somebody that with your code... Because like, like, like uh, what's his name, who died? The, who's the Philadelphia guy again? Um, Angelo Bruno, Johnny Keys. Johnny Keys. So when you tell the story in the podcast, so the Johnny Keys story shows me that, you know, Keys goes down and he's got a code right to the end. There's a code he lived right. by right to the end. And right. you're a man with a code. And you, who's someone who you, other than Keys, because you're on the record about him, who's someone else in organized crime that you really admired? You thought that they were tough, Smart, uh, 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 you know, productive. They made money. I mean, you're there to make money. This is not some uh, tennis club. You know what I mean? Right. Who's somebody Frankie, you admired? Frankie the Chico. Frankie the Chico. He was like a big brother to me. And um, and and uh, when John and his crew were in trouble for dealing drugs, they were going to get taken out. They came to me and Frankie the Chico and a guy named Joe Piney, a few people, for help be in this war. Without us, he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't live. When I talked to Frankie DeChico about it, I didn't want to be in that war. And I told Frankie, well, if we're going to be in it, I want you to be the boss. He said, I could be his underboss. He can't be mine. He's got an ego like the Empire State Building. We'll have nothing but trouble. Let him, we'll take over. Let him be the boss. We'll be the power behind the throne. If he doesn't act right, I give you my word, we'll kill him. I'll be the boss. You'll be my underboss. I said yes. Now, I'm going to give you an example of Frank and Chico, what I think of him. John had a powerful crew, no question. I had a powerful crew, no question. If you put our two crews together, we weren't a pimple on Frank and Chico's ass. <laughs> That was the real power. His whole family, women in the family, I think if you kill somebody in front of them, they'll help you move the body. Right. So they, this, this was the real deal. His father, his uncles were made, everybody, his whole family. And people loved him. So this was the real power. He's the guy who got blown up four months after the hit was, was done. Now, when you say about even the women in his family, you know, uh, women... I have written down here, mafia wives are often portrayed as blithe, numb women who turn a blind eye or pretend to, to their husband's activities. What's the reality? Did your wife know exactly what you were doing or you wanted to keep her, to an extent, to the best of your ability, shielded from what exactly you were doing? No, of course I shielded her from what I'm doing, all my kids or anybody like that. I always want, it's a protection thing. It's, I always wanted her to be able to tell the truth. Under a fucking lie detector, to the agents, what do you know? She would be like, duh. She would be blank. I don't know. I, I read things. I heard things. I'm not stupid. I, I understand he probably is in the mafia. 
what level or what exactly he does, she would tell you I own the construction company. But there's a lot of people in a lot of lives that are numb, as you say it. Right. Hollywood has a lot of guys who fuck around and do all kinds of things. Would we say all their wives are numb to that? No, no I, I mean, I just, so. I, just, I just feel like, you know, you, you only see this in films. You know, you only see good yeah, fellas well, and uh, uh, the, the, the women all hang out together and they... Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's a movie. Goodfellas is based on a true story. I knew that crew, Paul Vario and all of them, most of them. Um, and that's an exaggeration. It's a movie. It was very well done. Uh, but my wife was not like that. Um, and, and most of the women weren't. Now, some were. It was more the gumada, the girlfriend. You married a woman and she took care of your kids and she was a family woman. She was a good woman. She got roped into you. She fell in love with you and she stuck with you. But it was the Gumadas, the fancy uh, one with her hair and short skirts and everybody. And she was the one running around. And I'm going out with John Gotti or Sammy the Bull or whoever it may be. It was, it was her. She was the one you had to worry about. Well, we didn't have to worry about them. I mean, they were they were good. Uh, for they, what kept they, were they kept their mouth shut. They kept their mouth shut, but uh, we didn't have to really. You didn't deal too much talking with us. All you wanted to do was bed talk. Right, right. So <laughs> I understand. Yeah. The uh, um, I'll never forget. But this is Brian. You know, we're 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 there with uh, what's his name? Um, shit, Paulie Herman. We go to Cafe Central, the second Cafe Central, when they moved it downtown from the original one. And they moved it down to what was on like a 60-something in Columbus or wherever it was they went to. Uh, this is 10 million light years ago. And I'm with a bunch of people, and there's this woman there. Now, I, I'm, I'm completely admitting I could be hallucinating because I was much younger, obviously. I was a kid, and I was, uh, you know, I didn't look too bad back then. I wasn't an old man back then. And uh, you don't look too bad now. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I, I look at pictures of myself when I was in, when I was younger. I go, God, where did he go? But uh, <laughs> the uh, I got seven kids. I'm 64 years old. My wife and I have had seven kids in nine years. I got remarried. Seven. My I got seven kids. The oldest is nine. So you're my still life. Active. Well, you're I'm still I'm, active. Not, I'm not dead. <laughs> as I like to say, I'm not dead yet. So, but no. uh, but the but the point is we're in the we're in Cafe Central, the the, the newer one, the second one, and uh, and this woman is there. You can help me out to identify which one of these guys was the it was the wife. I think it was Persico. Did Alley Boy Persico have a gorgeous blonde wife? Absolutely. She is in a table, and she's looking at me, and she's smiling at me. And then she turns away. She's like in profile, and she's talking to somebody. And then she'd look over at me and smile at me. And then, and I'm sitting there, I mean, I'm pretty fucking stupid. I mean, I'm not going to embarrass myself. And then she does it again, you know what I mean? And, and my friend leans in and goes, don't look at her. I go, I'm not, I'm not, she's looking at me. I don't, I'm not, and he goes, but, but turn your chair around. He goes, and don't even look at her. Don't, don't even give her any attention. He go, he, I, I go, look, this is how fucking stupid I am. I go, why, why? He goes, that's Alley Boy Persico's wife. And he's in prison. And you're going to be so fucking dead, they're going to put you in a wood chipper and grind you up if you fucking flirt with his wife, you fucking moron. You know what I mean? And she was stunning. I mean, she was yeah, stunning. She was stunning. She was she stunning. Was. She was this gorgeous woman. And I learned, you know, that in, in that moment, you know, I got to make sure I don't, you know, smile at the wrong woman uh, in some of these clubs and restaurants in Manhattan. Speaking of right. clubs and restaurants in Manhattan, I don't want to lose the opportunity to ask you, um, uh, who did you say the... Uh, Goodfellas case was uh, Vary. What was his name? The Paul Goodfellas. Paul Vario. Paul Vario. So that was the uh, 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 the captain, the boss there. Yeah. What's his name? Uh, why am I blanking out? Um, who just uh, Sorvino, the head yeah. guy. So Sorvino is Paul Vario, and yeah. they show the famous scenes where he's slicing the garlic with the razor blade, and they're cooking all. The, and you look at The Godfather, and I'm going to tell you right. a funny story about uh, about uh, David Chase. 
and you look at the Godfather. Come on, pay attention, Mikey. One day you have to make dinner for uh, 30, 40 guys. You put in your sausage and your meatballs, then a little cup of sugar, then a little red wine. He's making the uh, pasta sauce. Uh, David Chase told me, I went in and I interviewed Chase for the bonus track for the box set of The Sopranos. I had begged Chase, I begged him on my hands and knees to be on The Sopranos, but other than Jamie Lynn Sigler, everybody had to be real Italian. He wouldn't cast you if you weren't Italian, so he wouldn't cast me. One time I think they asked me to play myself, I didn't want to do that. But So he asked me, do you want to come interview me? For the, for the director's cut of the box set of all the episodes and talked to him. And he said, I said, we talked about the genesis of the show, the origins of the show. He said, I only knew one thing when I started writing. He goes, I needed everybody to be at a table eating. He said, because that's what people do when they're in organized crime and they're in a family. They love to sit down together and eat. And they want to be together. And I tried to have as many scenes as I could of, of but people are always eating. They're at Bada Bing and they're eating a sandwich. You know, they're, 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 they're relaxing together, having food and a drink and what have you. Um, I asked De Niro. I asked Pacino. I asked David Chase. I asked some of the most famous Italian New Yorkers in history what was their favorite Italian restaurant or restaurants. Give me a couple of suggestions. In Manhattan or even beyond. Arthur Avenue. I didn't fucking care. Where did, wherever you, you go. And I was shocked that every one of them said Sistina on 2nd Avenue, which has since moved to like 73rd in Madison. It's some very fancy building. One of the most elaborate, fancy, starchy, you know, formal, expensive restaurants. What's a restaurant you love to eat Italian food in in New York? What was one of your favorites? Well, in, in, Manhattan, in Manhattan on uh, Mulberry Street, uh, I believe it's uh, Angelo's right. is the name of it. I mean, presidents, people, everybody went there. It's a great restaurant. We didn't go there too much because it had so much of a tourist trade. Right. And I believe the name is Angelo's uh, or Mary's. Or I think it's Angelo's. But um, th that was great. It was right on Mulberry Street. It was a great restaurant, great food, great service. And me, I stayed mostly in Brooklyn, Bensonhurst. I stayed in restaurants in places that really weren't all that fancy, but I went to them before I was anything, and I kind of stayed there, even though my rank or position, whatever you want to call it, increased. I always went back to the same places that I was going to for years. Um, I didn't like the publicity. Right. Uh, I got caught up but with, you like to eat. with Sean. Oh, I love to eat. And what was you know, so what it? What Italians, everything is breaking bread. You know, when That's we what sit Shea down, said. We, That's what he said. We, right. We break bread. We talk. We eat. I mean, in my house with my father and them, we would eat. Uh, you'd be at the table for an hour and a half. Mm. Not only would you eat the first meal, the andi pasta, the pasta, the this, the that. When you were done, you're drinking a little wine. You're breaking the walnuts or, <laughs> you know, with the, the, the and fruit. You're nuts, fruit stuff like that, and you conversed. It was a tie, family tie, uniting the family and keeping it together, you know, and keeping it close. The kids would go off and run off and uh, go play in the backyard, but uh, so it was not only a mafia thing, it was an Italian thing, basically. It was part of our roots. These two guys, uh I always tell this story in L.A. of all places. These two guys, Italian. They, now, there were Mexicans in the kitchen working for them, but the guy who was the chef in charge of the kitchen was Italian, real Italian, from Italy, came over from Italy. And his partner was uh, Italian. He was the maitre d', front of the house, back of the house. And he used to take linguine, and he'd throw it in a black skillet, and he'd scorch it on one side. It was cooked al dente, thrown into the skillet, and he would scorch the bottom of it like Chinese bird's nest, just brown it a little bit, then flip it over and brown the other side. So you had like a, you had like a shell. It was like, like you put two Frisbees together. It was a thick plate, and the inside, the noodles were all nice and cooked the right way. You know, they were a little al dente, and he seared it, and then he would put arrabbiata shrimp he put spicy shrimp tomato sauce on top of it. I'd cut my hand off if I could have that again. I can, the restaurant closed. <laughs> it, was my, it was the most delicious food I've ever had in my life.
All right, with the time we have left, um, I want to just say um, three things. One is uh, you always imagine that anybody who loves their parents, you know, I think about my dad, my dad died right as I really started to make it. I did a TV show, a soap opera here in New York, and I, you know, they didn't pay us a lot of money, but it was the beginning of my career. It's actually a wonderful place to start because it teaches you professionalism more than anything. You got to be there at 6:30 in the morning, 7 in the morning and know your lines and you got to, you know, you got to you you got to get it done because if you don't they'll fire you. you know, I, I watch people get fired. They come on for 2 weeks and they get fired because they were hung over the next, you know, one day. They didn't they didn't take it seriously. Right. So you learned less about acting actually than you did about a career in professionalism, how to treat other people and and they're relying on you. And uh but my dad dies 1983. Right as I'm getting off that show, uh, my dad died in April of 83, and I got off that show that fall. And that was the beginning of me uh, in, uh, uh, no, 82, rather. I go to L.A., I got off the show in 82, my dad died in 83, and he didn't see me go off and do other things that were more, you know, uh, successful and more lucrative, whatever. And I'm always really hung up, you know, I always feel horrible. My mom just died in May. And my mom is somebody who all of us worked very hard to take care of her in her uh, old age because she was kind of fragile. And uh, physically, mentally, she was sharp, un unbelievably so. She was sharp mentally, but her body was just shot. But my dad, I always think about all the things I wanted to do for my dad. I mean, I would have done anything for my dad. Buy him a house, buy him a car, buy him a weekend house, send him to Europe on vacation. I would have given him anything. I would have given my dad, because right. my dad killed himself. My dad took years off his life raising his kids and trying to do for his kids. He didn't have any money. He had six kids, and he was a school teacher. He didn't make a fucking dime, you know. He coached football. Right. All these ancillary jobs he had at the school, they didn't pay him very much money. So my point is, is that for you, um, my point is, is for you, what was it like with your parents over the years? Did you, did you like... Did you want to take care of them and buy them things and do things for them? And they knew what you were doing and where the money came from? Was there ever any friction with them? Did you try to love them and maintain them in your life? When did they die, both your parents? When? How old were you? I was uh, in my 30s. I was already a made guy. Um, they, they never knew that. But they were hardworking people. They worked 10, 12 hours a day. My mother was a seamstress. Right. My father was a painter. And then they opened up a small little dress factory, and he went in and worked with her. Um, and they worked hard their whole life. They didn't have a lot of money, but whatever they had it was always shared with the family, a dinner or this or that or the other thing. They bought a small little house in Lake Ronkonkoma uh, in Long Island. And uh, it was always all the uncles and cousins and everybody there. Back when that was the boondocks. Yep, yeah, that was definitely Quiet the out there then, quiet. Yeah, yeah, now it's probably all crowded. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah, so they, they were like that. Uh, they were great, legitimate people. I mean, but uh, I was always in trouble. I was always the black sheep. I was always, you know, the one. But by the time I went into the military, in and I was 19, I got drafted during the Vietnam War. They had retired and moved to uh, Long Island. And uh, then they moved back into Staten Island. They passed away in uh, living in Staten Island. But uh, I wish I could have spent a lot of more time with my father, going just simple things, going to a baseball game or something like that. I would go fishing. Yeah. He was originally, in Italy, he was a fisherman. So going fishing with him was, you know, like a big thing. And I really didn't give them any money. I didn't have anything while they were, you know, working until they got very old, then I took care of them as best as I could, but they didn't need it. They had their retirement money, very small appetite to do anything. They were up in age, they were sickly. So, but I was always there to take care of them, connections with doctors, whatever I could possibly do. They never asked me where I got money or did anything because I really, when they were alive, I didn't have big money. It, m big money started flowing you know, during their real old age, right. sick, and passed away. Right, right. So. Um, uh, now, people that I know who turn me on to the podcast, 
I want to talk about that for a minute, who turned me on to the podcast, told me that you've been, this is their word now, not mine, that you've been kind of raging and you've been really pissed off about the fentanyl craze. Is that correct? You've been going off about, yeah, tell me about that. Well, you know, I, I have a family member and I've got people, I have a big podcast I lost amazed, I, I, I'm, I'm amazed how many people who uh, lost loved ones, kids, and I started doing research on this thing, and um, it's the open borders, drugs pouring into the country, and I was starting to talk about it, and uh, the more I heard stories, the more people started calling me about it, the more I was talking about it, and I, I am in a rage about it. I really don't understand it. It's not that I don't, I do understand it. You know, they have these borders open. They have the information from the government itself. You know, one of the shows I did with a a woman who works with me, Anna, and uh, she's a psychologist as well. And uh, from November, I think, of 21 to November of 22, 110,000 people OD'd. Not all of them died, but 110,000. Now in New York, they just did a statistic, I saw it on ABC, I think it was, that every hour, three people OD. I mean, these are phenomenal numbers. We know it's coming from India and China. We know it's coming through the borders with cartels. And we're not doing anything. I gave a description, I was with Adam Carolla, and I said, if you get a ship with 200 sailors on the ship, and a country shoots a missile or a torpedo at it and sinks it, all 200 people die. I think you know it and I know it, we would go to war in two minutes. Why are we not going to war over this fentanyl? Why are we allowing this? Why? Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why I think the fentanyl market is what it is, and this is just my opinion. I don't expect this to make sense to anybody. I don't expect them to agree with me at all. I mean, I just, I think about it from time to time. I mean, I when I went to, when I lived in New York in the early 80s, I grew up on Long Island, and when I went into Manhattan and I started to make some money, I mean, you know, it's Manhattan. You want to you wanna live it up. You, know, you want to party. But someone else is always doing the driving. You're in a cab. There's no Uber back then. You're in a cab. You're in the subway. We took the subway all the time. And we walked. We walked our asses off. We walked from 110th in Amsterdam down to the Battery. You know, we didn't give a shit. It was, we, we stopped at every bar along the way, or at least we thought we did. And, you know, we had a good time. And, but we were shit-faced drunk, doing a little blow, or maybe smoke a little weed. But we did, mostly it was drinking. And it was a drinking town because someone else was doing the driving. Right. Then I go to L.A. and I'm behind the wheel of a car for two years and I'm shit-faced drunk and coked to the gills for two years. And I'm doing the driving. I mean, I snorted a line of cocaine from here to Saturn. I did a line on the rings of Saturn and then I came back with one more big fat line to take me home. You know, this was L.A. and cocaine was, you know, it was it. And I thought, oh, I'm going to outfox everybody and, and, and cut down my drinking. I'm going to switch to becoming a drug addict. So I do this for like, it's white hot for two years then I get sober I don't talk about that that much on the show but I get sober I've been sober since 1985 so this February I had 37 years sober no drinking no drugs 37 years I got sober right before my 27th birthday in 85 great and my point is is that I see now like drugs are always such a a reflection of the culture itself and these kids they don't want to talk they don't want to learn anything they don't want to share anything. I mean, if they want, if they, they they do if they want to, if they're in the mood. But they they want a drug that's good. They want to get wasted, like you throw a switch. Not like when we were young, where you were in a room and you put on some music and you talked, and you talked about a movie you saw, and you'd have a little drink and you smoke a little weed and you do a line or whatever. And everybody had like it was it, it was a part of something. It wasn't just you wanted to reach inside your brain and throw a switch and go lights out, like you're wasted. You would like they, and now. Like, to me, fentanyl and all these drugs are for people who don't have much to say. They're not very social. They're a little fucked up in some way. They're limited in a lot of ways. And what they want to do is they just want to get out. They want to get high fast. They want a fast-acting high. 
as, as a reflection of just their whole view of life. So I see these kids who take these drugs now, and I'm like, where's the fun? You know, you're just, you're like a zombie. You're like, a, a couple minutes goes by, and you're out. You know, you're, you're wasted. And I'm thinking, oh, I got nothing against getting wasted, but can't we draw it out over a couple of hours? Maybe throw in a slice of pizza or so, take, go take a walk? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. All right, so my last yeah, question. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Let me, let me answer this. Yeah. yeah. I, what I don't understand is that people who are doing marijuana or heroin or whatever they're doing, yeah. why, is, why are they lacing everything with fentanyl so these people don't even know they're getting trapped? Right. Not every one of them is a zombie. A lot of right. these people, and that's why there's so many deaths, because they're not they don't know the what's usual. There. They, right, they don't even know it's there. They're not the usual drug addict. Here's a kid smoking, and then they're coming in with ones that look like candy. Now, a kid at 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, whatever, you're not going to hook that kid that they're going to come back and keep buying drugs off you. So when this kid's getting it, you're straight trying to kill him. Yeah. This kid don't know no better. He eats two, three of those candies. He's not a drug addict. He's going to die. So wh th this whole thing with fentanyl is not, what well, you're saying, I get it. I lived through that era. I didn't try it. I didn't do it. But it was fun. It was exactly what you said, which is perfect. It's a difference of what's happening right now with fentanyl. We're not even, they're not trying to hook them. You can't hook a 12-year-old kid. The first kid, he eats two of those candies, he's dead. Right. And you got people now who's a heroin, heroin addict could live quite a while. But now you're lacing it with fentanyl. What is this about? Is this about to destroy our country? Or just kill people? Kill people. I think so. My friend said it. My friend, my friend went away. Uh, he left New York for like nine years, uh, lived overseas, came back because his wife had to take care of some business. Her parents died. She had to come over and clean up some business of her parents, some estate. And they came back for like a year. And he came back and he, I said, what was the things you noticed most? And he said, uh, you know, just social media and and phones and all that stuff. He said it just drove him up the wall. And he said, and I said, what's the thing that bothered you the most? And he's a very funny guy. He's a very odd guy. And he said, oh, the thing that bothered me most was uh, uh, GPS. And, and, and you don't learn where you're going anymore. The phone tells you where to go. And you have no fucking idea where you are. You have no fucking idea where you're going or how to get there. And the phone tells you where to go. He says, he says, what I miss is, what if you got lost? And he says, and you went to a gas station to ask for directions. And you went to the gas station, he said, and you met your wife. He said, you know, sometimes fate, you know, when serendipity uh, comes in handy. He said, now everybody's in a hurry. They don't have any time. They want to manage and control every part of their life. My last question for you is, um, or my, I got two more questions, is uh, I was surprised to see... In, you know, in some representations, that guys in organized crime are political, and a lot of them are Republicans. Is that true? Guys in organized crime are very law and order. Is that true? No, I, I, no. Don't, I don't believe that. I was always a Democrat, okay. and I think most of them were Democrats. Really? Okay. Because, yes, because they were easier to bribe and deal with and work with, and Republicans seemed to be, and conservatives wanted to always put you in jail. Yeah. So I don't think the mob liked the Republicans okay. and the conservatives. We, we went to the other side. I think now I'm hearing them, they sound more conservative and Republican. I'm, in the, I'm an independent in the middle. Right. I don't care who, what party you're in. If you make sense to me of what's going on, I'm on your side. Right. If you don't make sense to me, I'm against you. You know, and I see like people want to go into a party and they want to stand by that party no matter what they're doing. I'll give you a quick example. When I was young, I went for a haircut, an Italian guy, and I had a full head of hair, and the worst haircut I ever got in my life. And I was telling him, bro, look what you did. And I'm touching my hair. I said, look what you did to my head, bro. He says, Cause yeah, we we're both Italians. I said, what the fuck does that matter? 
That's, you gave me a bad haircut. I don't care if you're Italian, Jewish, black, white, green. It's a bad haircut. <laughs> so I'm not, you know, just because I'm Italian, I'm on your yeah. side, yeah. or just because I'm a Republican. I'm not. In, I'm not in that. But I go with or against, you know, what I think is right for the country. Because even for people I don't like, it should be good. You know why? I have to live with you. Yeah. I have to live with Bingo. people I like and people I don't Bingo. like. Bingo. Bingo. I, I really want things to be Everybody's good. Everybody's got to calm everybody. down. They got to calm down. Yes. Right? They got to calm all down. All this racist stuff and stuff should go away. I mean, we're all working together. We're intermarried. We're interrelated in so many different ways. We're people. And uh, I got one question for you. Yeah. When are you going to make that movie with the bear that chased you through the woods? Right. When are you going to do a part two? <laughs> well, my character's dead. He died. I, I have to do I, the prequel. I, I know. I I'll take prequel. that part. I'll take that part. I'll play that part. Do you know you that were, you take my part? You were great. Oh, thank, you want to know something funny? I'm in North Carolina, and my ex-wife and I are on vacation with her family. They lived in Georgia, and we used to vacation in Wilmington, North Carolina, because it was just a quick drive for them. It was like a seven-hour drive. They could do it in one day. And we rented a house on the beaches there in Wilmington for almost 10 years, like nine years. And uh, uh, and I'd done a reading in L.A., and we were living a lot of the time in L.A. then. I did a reading of that movie uh, with De Niro, who was going to play the lead. And then Bob comes and does the reading. There's a bunch of producers there and the writer and the director. And uh, the writer was Mamet. And uh, they read the movie, and Bob leaves. And I get the phone call that said, Bob doesn't want to do the movie. He doesn't think it's right for him. So um, I get on the plane. I go to Carolina on vacation with my wife's family, my ex-wife's family. And uh, they call me on the phone, and they go, uh, Tony Hopkins is going to do the movie. And I broke down crying. I, I was sitting on a bed. I'll never forget. I'm in a bed in the house we were renting on the beach in North Carolina. And I started crying. And I thought, oh, God, because this business has always been who you work with. Now, even though the movie right. didn't come out the way I wanted it to, because there was a lot of things they cut, the movie was much more of a psychological thriller than it was an action movie. The bear was a little bit less prominent. It was more like him and I fucking with each other about his wife and so forth and me trying to get under his skin. And, um, and just like a lot of weird dialogue and interesting stuff to act. And, uh, uh, but... I never look at movies and think about how they, what's the result. I don't really care because it's not my responsibility. I don't make the movie. Somebody else does. I show up. I try to understand what you want. I try to help figure out what you want. Some directors don't know what they want or, the, or maybe they have an idea but they don't know how to communicate to you. They may have a good idea but they just don't know how to talk and say it to you uh, for actors. Right. And so we do the movie and even though the movie didn't come out the way I hoped it would, it was not what I hoped it would be. It's still my favorite movie and the best experience I've ever had because of Tony. I mean, I just worshipped Tony. I mean, I worshipped him. And to yeah, be with it, him, he, he was he just... Was great. Oh, my God. He just done Nixon. Yeah. And he had just finished doing Nixon for months and months and months with Tony Hot, with uh, uh, Oliver Stone. And he did that movie with me. And uh, I did that movie with him. It was 1996, 26 years ago. And it was like right. the greatest uh, experience of my life. Because, I mean, movies are always about who you work with. You know, right. I work with Meryl Streep. I work with this guy. I work with that guy. And, um, and my peers, there's some of them I really enjoyed working with. But you always say to me, if you said to me, who do you want to make a movie with? I'd say, well, I want to make a movie with John Garfield. You know? Yeah. I want to make a movie <laughs> with Bogart. I mean, my, my peers... I like to make a movie with a few of them, but not many. You know, the people I really admire were people who were, you know, I want to make a movie with William Holden. You know, something like that. So, um, the, uh, uh, do we have, I go, there's one more thing here. Uh, the podcast with Jim Carroll. Whose idea was that? That was, uh, you know, when I, when I got out of prison, I was going to write a, a book, uh, a second book. I was going to write my, I was, helping my wife write a book. Somebody came to my wife and talked about doing a podcast and she asked if uh, I would help her with it. And I agreed to it and I started do doing the podcast. It was J James Carroll came to me. Um, he was going to do a documentary about me and uh, he was asking information. 
and uh, he had turned around and said, oh, wow, well, I'd love to work with you with uh, this podcast. So I said, all right. And I said, uh, how, you th how do you think it'll, he says, I heard, you know, you talk. If you could talk like that and on a podcast, he said, you'll get 25 million hits. I started laughing. I had just got out of prison not too long ago. I said, I know I could get 10 people for sure, my ex-wife, my son, my daughter. I am not going to get 25 million people. I think as of today, we got 85 million views. So uh, he was oh right. God. I mean, yeah, yeah, we, I have 520,000 subscribers, and we got 84, 85. Who are you with? Who are you with? What do you mean? Who who, who, like, what, what, who streams you? What company are you with? I don't even know. Okay. I do my own thing. And right. on SammyTheBull.com, right. it's out now on that. I was, uh, who? Orga it's organic growth, they're telling me. I don't know tech okay. stuff. It was organic. Nobody pushed it. Nobody did anything. It just went on YouTube. It went out on a few areas on, uh, and a few interviews. And it just went nuts. People just loved that story. I mean, the Johnny Keys and the whole thing. So you're making a few bucks? A few bucks, but I'm, 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 now, I'm now coming in. I'm, I'm actually signed up doing, there's somebody who wants to do my scripted story, that Johnny Keys story. They want to make a movie out of it and a Broadway play and a documentary. So that's what I'm talking to now, doing it. And I'm in contract, actually, with it. They're going to get mad that I'm even talking about it, but well, I'm talking about it with Alex. He forced me to do it. I made it, exactly. <laughs> like I could make you do anything. Now, 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 make sure you keep one thing in mind, and that is if they do this scripted stuff about you, you make sure you have a really good consultation with who's going to play you in the movie. Because there's probably not a lot of, there might be one or two guys I can think of off the top of my head who would have the balls to play you, who could really have the balls to play you in a movie. I see movies now, and I think to myself, the casting is just heartbreaking. You know, not, not that the people are bad actors. It has nothing to do with that. They're very perfectly competent actors. They're just not right for that part. That character right. has a soul. That character, you know, you're, 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 you're a very complicated guy. You know, one minute, one minute you, 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 you take an, an omerta, an oath of silence. Now you got 85 million people listening to you on a podcast. You know what I mean? Whoever thought, right. if, if you, if, if Sammy Gravano then could see Sammy Gravano now, you'd be sitting there going, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I'm on a radio show and I'm telling everybody all about Frankie, Frankie Balls and Tommy Bags and Joey Salami. I'm t you're telling all your, your stories. <laughs> but my point is you make sure that whoever plays you, they got to get a guy that has it he's got to have it yeah not a lot yes. of guys out there like that now there aren't you know yeah all right well, we'll, we'll work on that listen and if i have to, if i have trouble i'll give you a call you call me anytime you call me anytime yeah. listen i'm not thank kidding you and you can do thank hey you. listen thank you very much i, I appreciate I, I it too. okay buddy yeah what is the name of your podcast uh our, our thing is the name of the podcast it's our thing Thank right, you. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. We'll see you down the road. Ciao. Right, thank you. My pleasure. Awesome. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Wow. Bobby, thank you, you so much, brother. Appreciate no you guys. All right. Bye-bye.